of the days that you decide to start a podcast at 8 a.m. <laughs> and welcome to the Dave of the Dog Trainer podcast, episode 21. 21. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> Actually, much? it's 9 a.m. right now, yeah. but we did say we were starting at 8 a.m. We did. We were up in this room by like 8, 10. Yeah. We basically just fucked off for like an hour. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> I mean, you got to get the brain flowing. Yeah, the brain juices aren't... I am not a morning... Are you a morning person? No. No? Not at all. Okay. Not at all. I've never in my life been a morning person, and I've always been so jealous of people that are morning people. Yeah. Like, it seems like such a... You know, you watch these people, they get up at like 5 o'clock, you know, 6 o'clock, whatever, and they just get so much shit done by the time it's yeah. 8, you know, yeah. or 9 or whatever it is. And those Jocko Willinix out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Willinix. <laughs> However you say his last name. Willick. Is yeah. It? It's just like there's there's something so rewarding about getting up early and just getting a bunch of shit done and then feeling like your day starts. Yeah. You know, it feels like extra time. It does. I just can't do it. I can't do it's it. It's too hard. I've always been extremely productive in the evening. Like some of my yeah. best work I feel like I've ever done has been between the hours of 11 and like 3. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Um, but I can't get up early. So here we are. We tried. It didn't work. <laughs> it's all right. I mean, it's still earlier than we usually start. Yeah, for sure. So that's what matters. So what's new, Josh? Uh, <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> um, it's been a busy week. Um, went to Nuevo. Three, I've been there three times now. Oh, wow. Yeah. So why are you there so often? Well, the first time was uh, their new uh, menu for their regular restaurant. The second time was to get pictures of the chefs mm. for their website. And then Tuesday was supposed to be for their food truck, which I took pictures of the food of the food truck, but they don't have said food truck yet. Really? Because the yeah, the company that's wrapping the truck was still not finished with it. And they were like, we would love to reschedule it, but we literally have nothing for the food trucks. So, And we want to start social media for it mm. now. And I was like, okay. So and we at least got the food done. But that's cool. Yeah, they got a, they're doing a bunch of things there. They have like a, an event center upstairs. Mm-hmm. And they have an, an entire another menu for that. Like they do weddings and business meetings and stuff. And they have this like bougie like five star menu for that, and hopefully nice. I'll be getting that into that one next time. But Get to try that food, yeah. So they do that up there. Then they have the regular restaurant downstairs, and now, and they have a huge patio outside. And then they have the food truck now. Mm. And the guy was telling me because they were just doing interview after interview when I was there, mm-hmm. and basically in the winter time they. Uh, they go down to like 30 people, and then in the summertime, they That's need... a lot of people still, though. Yeah, but then in the summertime, they need like 95. Wow. That's when they're like I can imagine stuff. it gets popping down there. Yeah. but like it just, Some of these bars downtown and stuff, like especially by the stadium and everything. Yeah, but it just dies out in the winter so hard that they just can't you know, keep all those people on. So mm-hmm. I can only imagine how frustrating that is every year. Like yeah. We have to fill 60 spots every single year. Yeah, Jesus. Yeah, I wonder if they have a lot of like returning people that when that time comes around, they yeah. have people that come back every season. You I'm know? sure there's like probably that's a lot of training involved in that as well. I would assume. Yeah, exactly. You know? Um, but I was I was like really surprised, you know, mm-hmm. when I started to talk to them about it because I finally met the owner um, Tuesday, and she's a really really awesome. But uh. Yeah, they just she like is dipping her hand in like everything. Yeah. She was just like the food truck things just seemed cool, so there they are. Now they're doing it. <laughs> I feel like the idea of a food truck sounds cool. Mm. I don't even know where they go though anymore. You know, like I see them at Edgewater every now and then in the summer. Yeah, I but think, I not think very st- many other places. I think they still do the Walnut Wednesdays. What's that? It's uh, on Walnut Street. Um, they just get a bunch of food trucks, and it's just kind of like an event during Where's the summer. Walnut Street. <sighs> I think it's over somewhere by West 25th. Mm, that would make that sense. Way. Yeah. Nice. And they just like all line up and then you can go try whatever. That'd be sweet. Yeah. And let me tell you, this guy made 
Elvis empanadas. Elvis? Yeah. So it was peanut butter and bananas, caramelized bananas in a, in an empanada, you know, like oh, yeah, Taco yeah. Bell. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. And then dipped them in chocolate and coconut. <sighs> Sounds incredible. I don't know how people will like you using Taco Bell as the gold standard of yeah. empanadas. Though. Yeah. Well, <laughs> just in case anyone needed. <laughs> to you know, like know. that caramel apple empanada. Dude, that that thing was. Bell. That it's slapped. Delicious. It's I like don't think they even. seven cents or something. Yeah. I don't even know if they have it anymore. I don't know, man. I used to eat a lot of those, though. Oh, God. That was one of the best desserts on the fast food menus. Oh, yeah. Like out there. That, oh, yeah. the first, though, listen, I love an apple pie from McDonald's, but when they came out with the strawberries and cream pie there, that one's out of this world. Yeah. That one holds the top of my list. Oh, man. I'm going to have to try that now. Huh? Yeah, it's good. <laughs> Gets great, great with your morning coffee. Oh, yeah. You don't really drink coffee, though, do you? I don't drink coffee. Yeah, that's why mornings are probably so hard for me. Yeah, dude. I oh, literally boy. can't get, get up. a lot of caffeine to re- replace all those monsters I used to drink back in the day. Oh, my gosh. All right. So today, we get a couple things here. So today is going to be a kind of socialization podcast. And this is sparked by, I was talking about, I think, two podcasts ago, an experience that I had at Platform with uh, one of the guys there and talking about, you know, I kind of got on a little rant about talking about don't pet people's dogs in the public, uh, you know, talking about why it was bad. Uh, It sparked some questions from some clients. It sparked some questions from uh, some friends of mine, actually. Actually, the the guy in particular that had the puppy um, had had some additional questions and stuff on it and everything. So I want to break down the idea of socialization a little bit more. And we are going to kind of keep this catered towards new dogs right so okay. uh say you get a puppy and it's like all right i want to start off on the right foot and i want to make sure that we are uh socializing this dog properly in the three categories that i typically recommend doing so in okay um we'll dabble a little bit into the idea of if you go adopt a dog from a shelter and it has some minor social issues right maybe mm. not extreme aggression but quirkiness stuff like that we'll break down a little bit of that as well here um and um we also have a couple of questions that we received and we're just going to kind of start burning through some stuff so should be a fun one we'll see what we get so we're going to start with these questions i like getting those out of the way first before i forget about them Uh, also, if anybody hasn't seen our new island vibes miracle canine training t-shirt did you see that yeah, I saw the it. The pants one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Designed by Mr. OK Pants. Uh, they're fucking sick. Coming in two different colors. They will be here mid next week. I just got the confirmation exactly six minutes ago. Mid next week. Grab them while they're hot. I only ordered 50 of them, so they're going to go quick. You better bring me one. I'll bring you one. Where did you, you get them printed? Which color you want? Yellow, black. 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 Yeah. All right. Uh, proper press. We'll shout out a proper press real quick. There it is. A proper press over in Middleburg Heights. They're about 15 minutes from my house. Nice. They do the best printing in the area. They are super fucking cool and they're super fucking affordable. Get your printing done at a proper press. Ooh. Clip that. Put it on a proper <laughs> press's page. They can pay me for advertisement later. Boom. All right. Let's find these questions. <clears throat> Moving slow. Moving slow. Moving slow. If anyone forgot, this is the year of Island Vibes. For Island David. Vibes. He, had, he literally just showed me a Margaritaville <laughs> flag that he's going to brandish outside of his house. So <laughs> It's true. Literally stopped what he was doing to show me. I was like, hey, just so you know. This is going outside. This is going outside. All right. Here we go. Uh, this is from Tahoe's owner again. So I love when we have cons- – actually, both of these questions that I have are from people that consistently ask questions and consistently ask good questions. So let's get some new people asking some questions, but also keep them coming if you've been sending the questions. Because here's the thing. Yeah. Here's why I like this, right? Abby is her name, right? She owns a dog named Tahoe. First met her out in uh, Columbus. She sent her dog to a board and train at our Heights Canine Columbus location years back, Right worked with the dog, um, you know, trained the dog, whatever. She started coming up to Cleveland once we closed down our Columbus location for some follow-up sessions. They're from out of town. I believe they're from, like, Kentucky or something, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, Jesus. 
And what I like about this is Tahoe is a difficult dog, right? He yeah. is a dog that nothing is ever going to be perfect with him, right? Mm. But she is constantly striving to improve, right? She notices issues with certain things as she goes. Tahoe has had a ton of issues in the past with things. And she's been able to incrementally work through all of these issues by asking the questions. And this is the key, by following the fucking answers that we give, right? Because yeah. here's the thing. We get all these questions all the time. We get the same ones, right? Oh, my God, my dog barks at people when they walk in the door. Oh, my God, my dog <laughs> jumps on my guests. Yeah. Oh, my God, my dog pulls on the walk. Oh, my God, my dog won't come when called. Whatever. You know, any mm-hmm. of these things. And I, the amount of times that I've either written out a really long response or I have g- explained a really long response via the podcast or the YouTube channel we were doing before or any of that kind of stuff yeah. is so many times. So many times. And I get into details, right? I'll give you the details, right? I will give you all (laughs) of the little details for it. Yeah. And honestly, I'll break it down in a step-by-step way where it'll be pretty easy for you to work through this kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And then people say, oh, here's the answer. (laughs) And then they light it on fire and they never look at it ever again, (laughs) right? I th- and I don't know where this comes from. You, you help, help, help me, help me brainstorm this here. So, mm. what is it with, what is it with people that seek answers, but don't want to take action on the solution? Uh, this is a common thing in the world. I feel like, yeah. right? And this is any yeah. industry, right? People have issues with certain things, yeah. right? We'll use dogs right now, obviously, because this is the dog podcast, right? People have issues with certain things, right? Dog-related things. And then when you give solutions for those issues, and I'm, I'm generalizing right now, obviously. Yeah. The majority of our clients are phenomenal and do not do this, right? But there's de- there's this niche of people that will ask for the answer, right? Will provide the answer, and they'll be like, I don't know if I really like that answer. And they don't attempt it, right? But they continue mm-hmm. to have the issue, right? And it's this idea that... If you're having this issue, right, you're not in a position to decide if the answer is correct or not. You just got to try it, you know? And if you could just try it just for a week, seven days, (laughs) seven days of consistency with that solution, I promise you, you will see improvements. It might not be perfect because I understand that you are not going to do things as perfectly as I would hope that you would be able to do them. But if you stay 80% consistent with it, you will see 80% improvement in the behavior. Yeah. It's as simple as that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know. I think uh, I think nowadays people have a lot of problems with motivation and the need for instant gratification. Sure. You know, like, oh, I watched that video, but it seems really exhausting. Now I have to put that work in, mm-hmm. you know? Or they do it for like two days and they're like, my dog's not getting any better. Yeah. And then they just kind of fall off the wagon again. Yeah. What? I, so what's the last thing outside of photography or videography that you would say you learned, right? That you, you were taught or uh, you, you sought to be taught about something. Can you think of anything? Any hobbies, uh, things. <laughs> I don't know. You not <laughs> learn anything new, Josh? Uh, I'm trying to learn new things. I haven't learned anything like new, new in a while. <clears throat> I guess <laughs> that sounds awful. Mm. Oh no! I think there's something to be said about being a good student. Yeah, you know, with whatever it is that you're learning, you're actively wanting to improve on. Yeah. And here's the thing: what are I, I just? I, this is not going to happen, obviously, because I'm I'm getting all the wrong types of things. I just typed in like uh, how to be a good student. I was looking for some something that we could we could read and talk about here. Yeah. But I think let's, let's create our own list of being a good student. Josh, what are some traits of a good student? A good listener. Listener. Mm hmm. What else? Um, I, I guess the motivation, like being highly motivated motivation for the end goal the end goal yeah let's say yeah Um, i guess being uh i don't know like humble but 
That's the exact one that was going in my head right there. Yeah. Right? <clears throat> I feel like that's a big one for people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Last one here. Persistence and patience. Right? Yes. Okay. Now, let's take these and let's let's push them into the dog training world here now. Okay. okay? So these are the David and Josh tips <laughs> for how to be a good dog training student. Okay. Right? Be a good listener. Pay attention to the information presented to you. Right? We'll be in lessons all the time. Right? And, and this is... And listen, we, we have a good time when we're in our lessons. Right? We joke around. We, we're talking about other things. We try to make dog training a less scary, intimidating thing than it is. Yeah. Right? It's It's... It's... A serious thing, especially when you bring in dogs that have aggression issues or things like that. You know, it's a serious topic. And if you look at it too much with the lens of that seriousness, you could have a really hard time um, getting calm enough and relaxed enough to actually take in the information being presented to you. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, the trap we fall into is because we develop such good relationships with our clients with things and because we get loose with things here and there and stuff like that. We'll see some people that will almost fall into a trap of taking advantage of that to the point where, you know, we, we structure out our one-on-ones where maybe the first half of the lesson I'm teaching the dog whatever it is that the new thing is that we're working on. Yeah. And then the second half of it, we're instructing the owner on how to do it, right? Mm-hmm. And there, and then as we progress through the program, once we get this halfway point, typically what will happen is the dog will come in. I'll do a couple repetitions of something. They'll do a couple repetitions of something. The other person will do a couple repetitions of something. We kind of cycle around that way, right? Mm -hmm. We'll start to see people that will, while I'm working the dog, have the phone out, right? Checking something. Mm -hmm. Oh, I got to reply to this text real quick. Sorry. You know, chit-chatting in between, stuff like that, right? It starts to get loose where... Uh, the humbleness starts to kind of go away a little and you start hitting this point where there's nothing further to learn, right? Mm. Even when, while that's happening, I'll be trying to explain certain concepts, right? Yeah. Here's a new concept that we're working on right now, right? Uh, I want you to focus more on, I've noticed you, uh, when you pick up the leash, releasing your dog too fast and you're starting to create this cue that when you pick up the leash, you know, the dog is just getting up before you even say, okay, and this and that. And yeah. then, you know, we'll, we'll switch, right? And I'll have them do it. And then you see, I'll be like, okay, now do exactly what I just did, right? And it's like glazed over face. Yeah. Right? Yep. No clue. What? what? Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> and then it's funny because, like, we'll see some people that they don't want to be like, oh, I actually wasn't paying attention. <laughs> yeah. And they'll go and, try, they'll go and try to do whatever it was. Yeah. And they'll do the absolute complete wrong thing. <laughs> yeah. And whatever, you know, again, we yeah. joke about it. It's like, all right, cool. It's, you know, we got to yeah, yeah, pay yeah. a little bit more attention here. You know, yeah. this is what we're working <laughs> on kind of thing. Yeah. But step number one, being a good listener, right? When you go into these scenarios at any given time, you need to be ready to take in information, right? You need to be ready to listen or in this case, watch. You know, you can get into the different ways people learn. They're visual, they're hands-on. Uh, they like to mm-hmm. read things. I, th- I think those are the three is, is, is uh, you know, visual, listening, and hands-on, I'm pretty sure, is how people will learn, right? So so you need to be prepared to take in any of that information that's being presented to you, right? And you need to be able to ask questions throughout that process as you go if you're not understanding those concepts, mm-hmm. right? Because us as trainers, we will try our best to keep things slow and make sure we're presenting it in a digestible way, but there will be times that we get ahead of ourselves. There will be times yeah. that we work through things a little too quickly or we don't explain concepts well enough and um, – <clears throat> You know, you're not going to take in that information. So slow us down when you notice that, right? Ask more questions about those specific topics and understand that anything that we're doing that we're trying to show you, there is a specific reasoning for it, right? Nothing, when us as trainers, when we're doing lessons, right? Nothing we are doing is just because, right? There's yep. always a reason behind it. So strive mm-hmm. to learn that reason. And the better you understand that through listening, the better uh, you're going to be able to perform those things, right? Yep. Motivation, right? 
obviously you have to be motivated for the end goal, right? Mm -hmm. Now, this is a tough one in this industry because motivation for the end goal is the point here, not just the motivation, in my opinion, at least, right? Yep. Now, everybody is going to have a slightly different end goal as far as where they're motivated to get to, right? Mm -hmm. So a part of this falls on the trainer, a part of this falls on the owner, right? The part that falls on the trainer is understanding that if your owner's end goal is simply being able to walk their dog through the park and enjoy a nice walk and have the dog remain calm and not freak out or or lunge at dogs or this or this or this, and everything else in their mind is perfect, right? Yeah. You need to stay focused on their end goal. Mm -hmm. right so that they can stay motivated to get there right mm. now the responsibility that falls on the owner is understanding if they are that person right that just wants to be able to walk their dog down the street and everything else in their mind is really good but we start explaining methodically to them that these things over here that are seemingly so unrelated to your end goal are mm -hmm. actually extremely related and have to be addressed in order to achieve that end goal, you have to, as an owner, shift your association of those things to have that same motivation to work through them, right? Okay. And a part of that comes from being a good listener mm -hmm. and being able to understand those things that we discuss, mm -hmm. right? We'll see this a lot as well. Wolf Concepts, we talk about session after session after session after session right? Mm -hmm. And we get to session seven, session eight. We're like, hey, we really need to start cracking down on this, right? We really need to start working through this specific issue over here. Yep. And the owner will be like, whoa, really? Do we? And it's like, yeah, yeah. we talked about it for the last <laughs> seven weeks. <laughs> seven weeks. Yeah. So you got to be able to take in that information. Bring a notepad with you. We have clients that do this. Listen, I am team taking notes. Yeah. I take notes over the most unnecessary things ever because I don't fucking remember shit. <laughs> right? And because I don't remember shit, I write, write down. things down. <laughs> Every podcast we've done so far, I have the dumbest little notes. The dumbest ones. <laughs> like, literally. Like, like, <laughs> I don't know what the fuck we were talking about here, but... Pack walk, solve issues, socialization, slow and short, understand the dog, reciprocating, annoying dogs, testing dogs, uh, uh, ch -ch -ch. constant enrichment, toys, treats, rocks, pacing, looking for trouble. Well, just, just dumb notes, right? Because I forget everything, yeah. right? And if you take notes down, even just keywords like that, like as I'm reading those notes, I could remember what conversation was being had while I was taking those notes down, right? Those are those are my trigger words, right? Yeah. So take notes down. Bring a notepad. The amount of people that do that is so little. So oh, little, sure. yeah. right? But we have people that do it, and the people that do it know what we're talking about. I can remember one of the last people that came in. Uh, this girl, her name's Rachel, Rachel Collins, right? She's got this dog, Sprout. Right. Sprout. Um, so so um, Rachel came in with her dog. She only did two, maybe three sessions. Right. It was kind of like, hey, I, you know, I'd kind of known her or whatever. Mm. You know, I was like, all right, you can come in. I'll help you with some of the issues you're having with the dog. Young little English bulldog probably giving him kind of a hard time. Right. OK. Um, and dude, she came in full fucking notebook every single time, had a list of questions about the practice that she did at home. Right. Yeah. And every time we were working anything took detailed notes on exactly what I told her to work on at home. Yeah. And guess what? In those three sessions that we did, she, it, was, it was like perfect. Like she can't like end a third session. It's like, great. We don't need to do any more right now. Right. Because yeah. she shifted the efficiency of her training. Right. Mm -hmm. She made it as efficient as possible. She made sure that she was a good student. Right. She made sure that she was a good listener. She made sure she remembered those things. She was motivated for her end goal, which is to have her dog stop jumping and biting her and to have the dog come when called. Uh, she was humble in understanding that she didn't know all of these things to begin with. And she was persistent and patient with the process. Yep. She didn't get in a rush and be like, oh my God, this is going so poorly at home. Mm -hmm. She knew what our target goals were for each week and she was patient to get to that end goal knowing we would get there eventually. Yeah. Right? 
This is what I want everybody to strive for because you could make this so much easier on yourself. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You could achieve these goals so much faster by putting yourself into that state of mind. Yeah. And I think so many people miss that, right? Mm -hmm. Photography. I'm sure you were a good listener to your mentors that you had. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you were motivated for your end goal was getting to a place where you could support yourself with it. Yeah. You were humble about knowing there were people out there that knew more than you and mm -hmm. you were patient and persistent with the process. Yeah. Right. Lots of patience, <laughs> lots of persistence. <laughs> <Listen>. <laughs> and yeah. And I, th <laughs> for me personally, like humbling, mm -hmm. like that's, that's the biggest thing. Cause I'm, yeah. Not to be one of this, you know, astrological signs or whatever, Astro <laughs> whatever it is. Uh, but like I'm an Aries. I'm, but that's just who I am. I'm like, what always, does that mean? What does I'm, that I'm mean supposed to be, be always Aries? like hot headed and like, yeah. Yeah. Egotistical. Okay. It's a very, like big ego thing. But uh, yeah, I've been humbled pretty much every step of the way mm. of my journey as a photographer. So um patience persistence yeah always willingness to learn well listen you know i think that comes with every industry and here's the thing and i'm oh, yeah. sure you would kind of agree with this to an extent as well is as you start improving with these things it gets more difficult to maintain that yeah you know especially the humble part right mm -hmm. actually all of these right so so as an established dog trainer now right how this, this is a good question actually how often do I listen, right? And, and and we're referring to continued growth right now. We're not talking like 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 listening to clients and this and that. Yeah. My listening, I I I like to think that I still stay extremely aware of where the industry is at as a whole, right? Yeah. And I think the thing is, your listening shifts from listening to learn, and it shifts more to listening to understand. Right. Mm, yeah. And I, even though those are very similar, I think there's a slight difference. Right. I think listening to learn means you're trying to improve your current thing. Right. And yes, obviously, we're trying to do that. We want to improve the things that we're doing. We want to improve yeah. our skill sets and stuff. Right. Listening to understand means making sure that you are staying aware of what's going on around you. And though you may not be learning from the standpoint of improving yourself about those things. Even if you disagree with 99% of those things, if you understand them, you will grow from that, right? It may mm. not be improving your skill set, but it's improving your understanding of the industry as a whole, which will then in turn improve yourself. Yeah. Right? So I try to do a lot of that, I would say. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing. Every now and then I notice things where it may not be a learning thing at this point because I think there's only so much in the dog world that you could really learn, right? Mm-hmm. And I think it, um, I, I think it, I think it shifts to that. I'm, I'm losing my train of thought a little bit here with that. Uh, but listening to understand, right? Always strive to understand why everybody's doing the things that you uh, would like, right? Mm -hmm. Motivation for the end goal, right? The end goal still should always be to obviously provide the best possible service to your clients, and to be able to provide the best possible service to your clients past what other people are able to do, right? Mm -hmm. I want to. This is where your ego can kind of kick in a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. I want to be the best at yep. the specific thing that I'm doing, right? Yeah, no different sure. than I'm sure you want to be either. And I think oh, that, yeah. that doesn't, that doesn't uh, contradict being humble. I think you could be mm -hmm. humble while wanting to be the, the best because oh, yeah. it's not saying you are the best. It's just saying that is your end goal. And the cool thing about that is that end goal will never go away then. So you can maintain mm -hmm. that degree of motivation long term. Yep. Right? Mm -hmm. So the motivation is always there to continue doing that. And especially, you know, I love seeing new trainers coming up and I love seeing, um, you know, motivated young individuals that are starting to, to kind of get their foot in the door with this kind of stuff and watching mm -hmm. them grow as long as they're obviously uh, providing a good service and, and, they're, and they seem like they, they kind of hit all of these four things on the head. Right? Yep. <clears throat> Um, but that continues to push me and motivate me to you are always in a position where you can get knocked down to second place, 
Mm -hmm. right? So staying motivated will continue to force you to do all these other things, right? And I would say that those are my motivations at any given time. I want to provide the best possible service for my clients first and foremost, right? And if I do that, that will always get me looking critically at what I'm doing to make sure that it's always hitting that end goal. Right? Yeah. And that's why we've been able to grow as quickly as we've been able to. Yeah. And it's, you got to have that perfect balance, like you were saying. Yeah. Because if you, if you think too down on yourself, you'll, that's where people get stuck and then they sure. stop. And, but you can't mm-hmm. be over egotistical. Like now, you, here's the thing, right? Humble does not mean being down on yourself. And motivated to, to, to provide the best possible service and to be the best at it does not mean you're being down on yourself either. Yeah, right? exactly. It's more of a the, the, the glass half empty versus glass half full kind of thing, yep. right? Is understanding that you don't have everything there right now, right? But it can mm-hmm. continue to fill up, right? Exactly. As opposed to looking at it like it's it's empty. Yep. There's nothing there to begin with. Yeah, right? exactly. So yeah, you're, you're 100% correct, right? Uh, being humble, right? Always being aware that, again, somebody can knock you down a little bit, right? Mm-hmm. Always being aware that there's always going to be somebody out there chasing you to try to bring you back down to that position, right? Mm -hmm. And staying humble to know you don't have all the solutions. And in my case, right, I would say that that shifts as we grow the business, less about the dog training side of things, right? Less being humble about, wow, our training can be better and this and that, which is all all clear things we do, right? Mm -hmm. But being humble as we grow into new uh, avenues and as we grow into new positions and employees and this and that and understanding that we need to be humble as a whole of the company, right? The company is humble as we're constantly growing. We're not fully there yet. We want to continue improving, right? And then the persistence and the patience, right? If you look for the growth and the, the, the millions of dollars and the fucking success and the fame and the glory and all that kind of stuff right away, <laughs> it'll come eventually. Yeah. But it's going to be a long road. Yeah. It's not going to be an overnight. It's not going to be an overnight. 99.9% of the time. <laughs> 99.9% of the time. Yeah. You didn't win your COVID millions. <laughs> It'll be all right. I saw they just had their first uh, college winner. Did mm-hmm. they have the first million dollar winner as well? Mm-hmm. Who was it? Just Joe Schmo? Yeah, some girl. I want to hear her talk about winning it. <laughs> I want to, yeah, like I want to just be like, I want to see her face where it's like, Jesus fucking Christ. <laughs> I just want a million dollars because I got a fucking vaccine. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like. <laughs> How yeah. ridiculous of a feeling would that be? Yeah, How know. ridiculous. Yeah. It'd be wild. You know what what seems weird to me is like, you know, like all these movies where uh you you uh you know you find the 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 treasure or this or that and then suddenly like you get like cursed from it or like weird shit starts happening. <laughs> yeah. This feels like that kind of scenario where she's gonna win this million dollars and then like all of a sudden there's gonna be this like dark glooming Omnious figure following her yeah. around, just tormenting her forever. Yeah, <laughs> just weird stuff happens. Like, yeah. I don't know. It's true. I mean, <laughs> it happens to a lot of lottery winners. Actually, a lot of them just lose their minds. Yeah, I don't know, man. I mean, especially <laughs> when you look at the people that are winning a lot of these lottery winnings. Sometimes, you know, like, mm-hmm. and they're just Joe Schmo, like lower class whatever individuals yeah. and they go from that to like multi gazillionaires overnight and then they without the understanding of with great power comes great responsibility yeah and it all goes out the window yep. and great taxes <laughs> you don't even know yeah, yeah it's like these people they like think a million dollars you're only coming home with like 600k yeah get taxed like 40 percent on that it's gonna great. be fun <laughs> i'll still take 600k yeah. DeWine, send it my way. Yep, please. All right. Uh, <laughs> we're Sorry, fucking ranting good, today. Good tangent. There. We are ranting. All right, being a good learner. So Abby Elizabeth is a good learner. Yes. Is what I was getting at. Digressing here. <laughs> <laughs> she wants to continue learning with Tahoe. She wants to make sure that she is constantly improving because she's a good listener. She's motivated for her end goal. She's humble. And she's persistent and patient. All right. Here's the question. Oh, wow, we didn't even ask the question, man. We were just praising her for like 30 minutes. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <clears throat> From yesterday at 1023 a.m. All 
All right. If you're taking some questions for the podcast this week, I have a question. What, <laughs> what do you do when a dog has no chill? Tahoe has good obedience. If we are out walking or actively doing anything, but sitting and just relaxing at a patio or this past weekend at the beach, he cries. I always thought I would just let him cry it out, but this weekend he cried for six hours while we sat at the beach. Jesus. The majority of the time, it was low-level crying, but if I got up and moved around, it turned into full dog screaming. For context, <laughs> corrections on the e-collar, low-level or high-level, only seem to exacerbate his cries. Would love to know your thoughts. And then we have a video attached. <laughs> All right, let's hear Tahoe. Oh, this is the worst crying, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh. That for six hours? Six hours. Uh, well, Abby, I'm sorry. That sounds horrible. <laughs> but let's talk about it. Um, I'm going to use an example here. Vinny. Yeah. The best example. The best example. Right? Wonderful context. Right okay. Here. So let's let's start this out by saying, it, it, well, let me explain the video as well. Okay, so that video is just a video of Tahoe holding a downstay, crying. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's it. Crying. Now it was only five seconds long, whatever. So I don't know how reliable you know his downstay was. I don't know if he broke it. I don't know if, in the context of her getting up, if he was getting up out of that downstay as well. You know, whatever. There, there's there's yeah. multiple layers yeah, yeah, yeah. to this, right? But some dogs are very, very, very vocal, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of it comes to their inability to sit still, obviously. The lack of practice of sitting still for extended periods of time and conditioned associations of really fun things in certain places, mm -hmm. right? So Vinny, right, for example, my Malinois, is a fucking vocal dog, Right? He chirps. He makes weird noises. He sounds like a bird sometimes. He looks like a bird sometimes. <laughs> True. <laughs> True. <laughs> and uh, uh, he, he notoriously is a loud dog in certain situations, right? Now, a part of this equation is me understanding and accepting that that's kind of him at times, right? Mm -hmm. Now, after I accepted that that's the type of dog he was, what that helped me do was that helped me to calibrate my expectations, right? It helped me to be able to say, okay, you're a loud vocal dog. This will probably not get perfect, right? Yeah. But can it get better? Yes, yes, right? So here's what I did, right? I looked at first and foremost some of the situations that he was notoriously the most loud in, right? Two examples, right? The facility, because since he was a puppy when I got him, we went to that facility and we did bite work. And we did that over and over and over and over and over again, right? Mm -hmm. Second situation, um, taking him to fields, right? Yep. Since he was a puppy when I got him, we would go to fields and we would do high energy training, high energy training, throw the chocolate ball, high energy training, throw the chocolate ball, mm -hmm. right? Two very, very, very arousing condition associations, right? Yep. So... Anytime I took him to those environments, I needed to ask myself first, what is the reinforcement behind the whining or the vocalization, right? Uh, in his case, it was doing those things. So what did I do? We're nixing those things for a little bit. We are <laughs> yeah. no longer doing those things because I know that doing those things created that state of mind with him and made it horrendously worse over time. So. Yeah. I removed them completely. Like, mm. like we do not go to these fields and play chuck it anymore. If we play chuck it, we'll do it in the backyard for a little bit, right? But I don't go to these fields and do stuff like that anymore. I don't want to create any more arousal and make the problem any worse, right? Mm. We don't train bite work anymore because that put him into way too high of a drive state of mind. And especially now that he's living a quasi pet dog life, I do not need him to get into that level of drive and rehearse it. And there's been a point of contention of letting him get it out of their system and this and that. Yeah. Again, this is just what's worked for me, right? I removed those things, and I started doing some boring shit with him. And a part of this came from also, I started looking at other places. Okay, let's look at other places where I might be doing similar activities where my dog is good, right? Um, public, right? Mm -hmm. Vinny, since I got him, I took that dog everywhere with me, 
Yeah. Literally, right? Like mm-hmm. we went to Home Depot. We went to Target. We went everywhere. We went to Costco. We went to all these different places. And anytime I went to those places, Vinny went with me. And guess what he did when we went to those places? Absolutely fucking nothing. Yeah. He walked nicely with me. When we had to stop and check out or do anything, he held a down stay. Mm-hmm. Nobody touched him. No dogs came up to him. Nothing highly arousing happened. And he minded his P's and Q's. Right. Mm -hmm. And I still say to this day for as wild of a dog as Vinny is, if I had to pick one of my dogs and take them to a really busy public place that was like an indoor kind of like store or something or like use them as like a service dog in these situations, Mm -hmm. Vinny would be the dog. He is the most reliable with that kind of stuff when we go places. Right. So I looked at the contrast of, okay, cool. You can do a 20 minute downstay in a store and just like have it be not even an issue. But when we go to these other places and go to try to do that same exact thing, it's extremely hard for you. And that tells me what's the difference. What's the contrast between the two. It's those activities that I'm playing, right? Mm-hmm. It's creating that type of arousal, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so I eliminated that from the thing. I stopped doing those things, right? And I started trying to shift his perception of those types of places to that of what I had when I would go to these other places, right? As soon as I started doing that, right, it was same deal, a lot of vocalization. I would put him in a down, and I could be at the park for an hour, and he would probably chirp the entire time in that down stay. Mm -hmm. I'd put him in a crate at the facility doing nothing for six hours, and he would be pacing around in there being a little psychopath and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And little by little, incrementally over time, with my persistence and patience, it improved, and he got more quiet, and he settled quicker, and he mm. got more reliable, and it became much less of a problem. Now, because yeah. I had this past of conditioning in all of these types of things, it it never got perfect, right? But it mm. got to a place where it was so manageable, it was not even a problem, yeah. right? So the first thing that I would look at here in this situation, right, is I would ask the question one how reliable was that downstay just to begin with because that's mm-hmm. the key is having the communication and something to hold the dog accountable for when you would get up and walk away would he actually get up out of that downstay um you know would he maintain it perfectly the entire time mm-hmm. and what i would do is i would make high level corrections for breaking that downstay to have a clear expectation right we're going to yeah. have one thing we're going to hold to the highest standard right mm-hmm. From there, you got to understand that the crying and the arousal and stuff in a lot of these situations is subconscious. We talk about this a lot, right? Mm -hmm. The dog is probably not super aware of the fact they're doing it. They're just cycling in their head, right? He's probably in his mind just focused on, I need to hold this down, but I'm stressed that mom is over there and it's just, "Mm -hmm. I can't see, I don't know how to move, you know? Yeah. So because of that, correcting for it is not going to help, right? And Mm -hmm. actually, like you said, it's going to make things worse. It's going to make him more amped up because he's not knowing this is for whining. He's just knowing, I think I'm doing the right thing and I keep getting corrected yeah. and I don't know what to do. So and I'm getting more pissed off and more frustrated. Yeah, right? creating a lot of confusion. So save that high level correction for something clear and identifiable to the mm-hmm. dog. Right. Second thing I would look at is why, what were the two examples? Patio and beach, right? Why are those two situations so difficult for him? And is there a situation where you've simulated something similar, so the idea of just sitting back and lounging and relaxing with your dog, um, is there is there is there a situation like that where you've done something like that elsewhere where he's really good with it? Let's let's take mm-hmm. the example of in the house eating dinner. If you have him hold a down stay for the whole time you're eating dinner at the house, is he reliable with it? Right, mm-hmm. and. If you say yes, then we have to look at the contrast of in this type of setting, what's creating the arousal so we could remove that reinforcement, right? And maybe just the idea of needing to do it more, right? And obviously, if you're at a patio or somewhere where it's going to be disruptive to people, you're going to have to pick a different setting. But like I tell people, like, you know, parks around the corner from us, Edgewater, you could go and, uh, you know, you can go on a picnic table and put your dog in a down and just chill there for an hour and hang out you know, mm-hmm. and simulate it like that and start doing that once a day for a week, you know, yeah. or, or once every other day for two weeks or something like that. And once you start getting into the practice of it and understanding he's going to whine the whole time and to make your expect it shift that expectation, right, to just the down. I just want him reliable with this down here, and I just want to get him used to experiencing this, right? You will see improvement with it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, 
And then if you say no to like he can't do that in the house because we just don't practice it or whatever, you need to start finding places outside of these types of situations to start working on it in. Because maybe the problem is not the place. Maybe the problem is the extended duration. Right? Maybe the problem is once you have him hold a position for longer than a couple minutes, he starts getting real, real antsy. And that then would be the issue in my mind and what I need to work through. Right? Yeah. So you got to look at a couple different things here with that. Right? You got to look at shift your expectation. The expectation is not no whining or anything initially. The expectation is just holding a downstay the entire mm-hmm. time. Two, what's the reinforcement behind it? Is it the place or is it the actual activity that you're doing of the extended duration? Mm. And then if it's the place, you need to start simulating that place significantly more often, right? And if it's the activity, so the extended downstay, you need to find more opportunities to work on that in, right? Mm. Uh, And then the last thing is um, holding him accountable high enough with the actual down, right? The actual expectation, yeah. Right, which is super firm corrections for that. With Vinny, I would correct him on a hundred for that when he would break it, right? Because he was so jacked up, right, mm-hmm. that I knew I needed that super high level to have that quick snap out of it and get back down into it. Yeah. Right. So that's how I would address this. Long winded <laughs> response. No, it's good. How's the battery over there? It's doing good. Good. Uh I <laughs> think that's a great um correlation of working with you know thinking that it's just high energy at these certain places but your dog has a lot of energy say like you said like at dinner time or Mm -hmm. anything like at the house that he probably has the same energy but he's just able why is he able to keep it there together there versus over here at the beach you know and And I don't know if that's the case, right? And that's why I'm kind of presenting these alternatives is because I don't have all the details. I'm not able to ask follow-up questions right now. And I would, I think a lot of people don't practice duration work as much as they should, you know? Yeah. Uh, I, and I don't even at this point either. And I was talking about this with a client yesterday. And that's why when I took Vinny to platform, when I had him hold like a two hour long down, say he probably broke it a couple of times throughout it where he never would have done that before, right? Yeah. It's because I don't practice it anymore. Mm -hmm. But it is key and essential to make sure your dog can do it, man. There's no reason why your dog can't hold an hour to a two-hour long bed stay or down stay if needed. Yeah. And if you put that into practice even one time per week while you're doing something else, it's not even like you need to actively be there for the whole time. Yeah. You know, go cook and eat and have your dog hold a down stay the entire time. Yeah. If you could start getting your dog into the practice of that, that is huge. For sure. Boom. Boom. Got it. <laughs> All right. What else we got here? Next. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Next question here is from Courtney, Ponchke's owner, who always asks phenomenal questions as well. This question is about Doozy. This is her new dog. Like doozy. doozy. He's like a little uh, kind of shepherd mix kind of dude. He's a good dog. Is he a doozy? He's a doozy. He's just like a li- little little idiot, you know? Yeah. <laughs> he just got little idiot vibes. Little idiot vibes. Yeah. Just cute little idiot vibes. All right. <clears throat> New question. This is a behavior I'm not familiar with, so feel free to use this if you wish. <laughs> doozy loves booping things. Oh. Boop. He will touch his nose to your leg as he passes. Well, I assume it's partially hurting instinct. He doesn't gain pets, affection, a change in direction, etc. When he's leash walking or actively working on something, he doesn't boop. It tends to happen when he's relaxed and doing his own thing. Almost seems like he's circling back to check in and then goes about his business. Is this something we should correct for or an appropriate behavior to expect? Interesting question. Okay, so... yeah. Uh, this is another one where I would like to ask follow-up questions because what does this booping really entail, right? Is it yeah. like a full-on, like he's bashing into your leg yeah. kind of thing, right? Or is he just coming over and his nose is like repeatedly brushing against you? Yeah. Or is it just like a... Yeah, no, just... You know? Just like an annoying, like, hey, <laughs> hey, right? I, You know what's funny is I look at this like, so Vera, right? Yeah. Uh, my, my pity, Vera... With other dogs, does you've seen her do the muzzle oh, yeah. punch? Yeah, just yeah, <laughs> right. Like, yeah. like she'll straight up go up to another dog, and it's funny. Like she'll look at them, and she'll just be like, 
Yeah. <laughs> and like, like you'll see their whole body like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, like she'll push their ass yeah. to the side. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And listen, like whatever, from a dog on dog standpoint, and it's like, it's a conscious thing that she's doing. I think is what yeah. I'm getting at with it. She's yeah, yeah, yeah. consciously muzzle punching these dogs. Mm-hmm. Right. Now a boop, right. What is a boop? Right. A boop yeah, is like the same boop. thing just with the nose kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, you know, how intense is it is my question. Because is he doing like what Vera's doing to other dogs to you? Or is it a slightly less intense version of that? Or is it literally just a touch? Right. Yeah. So the first thing I would ask in this situation is, is this a very conscious, annoying thing that he's doing? Right. Like, like, does he know what he's doing and he's coming over and he's trying to get a response out of you? Right. He's yeah. actively trying to control the situation. Mm. Right. Mm. Um, or is this a subconscious like he's just excited when you get up to go walk into the kitchen? And because Vinny does this right where like he'll get up and like start circling around you a little bit and then his nose kind of bumps into you a couple times kind of thing. If it's that, I think you got to just kind of understand that like your dog's pumped up and kind of bumps into you and stuff like that in those types of situations in the case of if he is actively doing it to try to control in that situation it depends how intense it is right if it's just a little harmless like little thing and it's so like like it's just something i'm aware of but it doesn't like really bother me or anything and i'm not providing any reinforcement for it i might let it slide yeah but if it's anything more than that i probably would give a correction for that and the reason for it is because I really don't like encouraging dogs to um, to essentially push around or try to control people, right? Mm-hmm. I think it's, even though, you know, Doozy's obviously a harmless dog, right? Even though, you know, dogs that do it may be completely harmless with it, I think that idea of challenging and controlling repeatedly is a is an unhealthy state of mind for a dog to be in and, co- and leads to potential issues later down the road. Mm-hmm. Right. Maybe not mm-hmm. anything major, you know, yeah. but pot- potential issues you could run into for that of them then trying to challenge guests. And then if they start getting nervous about something and knowing that they could challenge people at turning into something slightly more dangerous or yeah. or any of those types of things. So it, it sounds pretty harmless, uh, but I would probably say if it's something very conscious and annoying and it's just like, why the hell are you doing this? You know, mm-hmm. I probably would get on it a little bit. You know, I don't think it needs to be anything major, but start letting him know you don't want him to do it and see if you see a reduction in it. But that's, again, only if this is a conscious thing that he's doing. So, good question. A diff- it's a question I've never been asked before. <laughs> the boop question. The boop. <laughs> All right, we're an hour in and we've talked about a bunch of nothing. I like it. <laughs> wow. Actually, we've talked about a lot of things. Yeah. Ending there uh, with that. Was that your last question? Or did you give that was the last question. Okay. Keep asking those questions, everyone. Keep asking yeah. those questions. We love answering those questions. Yep. And they pretty much always become clips. Mm-hmm. So on the YouTube channel. Keep asking them. Do it. All right. So. <clears throat> um, yeah, she, said, she said, don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> currently trying to sucker one of my employees into watching Vinny for the day on Saturday. It's not working. <laughs> um, okay, so we're going to start getting into the meat and potatoes of today's podcast here. So, like I said, we're going to be talking about socialization a little bit here. I think this is probably going to be like a socialization part one and part two kind of sitch. We're going to do part one today, which is just the concepts of socialization, discussing our ideas behind how we do it, why we do it, and then we'll get into some tactical stuff for the next one as far as socialization. So, um, what's up? said, cool. Dope. Plans. Look at that. We have a plan. It's a, it's a very loose plan. <laughs> it's a very loose plan. <laughs> it's more than we usually have, yeah. so I'll take it. All right. So, <clears throat> socialization, right? This is the freaking most discussed debated topic out there in the dog world i would say right everybody from trainers to owners to this and that everybody knows you need socialization Uh nobody agrees on how to do it at all so i want to break down the three types of socialization that i feel we have and then I will discuss some concepts of it. Again, like we said at the beginning of the podcast, this can be very much geared towards a new dog, right? We're getting our puppy, right? We're 
trying to expose it the correct way to the great unknown, mm-hmm. right? So the three types of socialization we have. People, so does your dog know how to interact with people, right? All yeah. sorts of different types of people. Big, tall, black, white, male, female, fucking every, everything. Kids, adults, mm-hmm. right? Dogs, does your dog know how to interact with other dogs, right? Do they know how to play properly? Do we understand how to allow them to play properly? Do mm-hmm. we know how to not get scared off by the noises and the sounds and the biting and the jumping? We had a client the other day. We posted a video of uh, this dog, Hugo. It's a little guy, right, in for training right now. Hugo's a playing machine. He mm-hmm. takes on these big dogs like no one's business, and he's like this big, <laughs> whatever. Hugo, again, super social, right? Yeah. Owners carry him around everywhere. It's the baby, whatever, you know? Mm-hmm. So they're like, you know, how's he been with the other dogs? Like, he's been great. Couldn't be better. Social butterfly. We let him with any dogs here, right? Mm-hmm. You know? His reply was, he jumps and bites the face a lot. I don't like that. <laughs> okay. Listen, again, you know, yeah. like we'll, we'll explain the process to him and stuff. I'm not trying to, to hate on this guy yeah. or anything, yeah. right? But we don't determine what play is. No. Right? Only dogs understand that kind of yeah. stuff, right? And it's our job to under, again, learning to under, listening to understand, right? It's our job to understand how dogs play. It's our dog to under, our job to understand what it means when they do different types of things. Yeah. And it's our job to not get scared off by those things. And because we're scared off by those things, not allow our dog the opportunity to socialize, to right? Com- to communicate, basically. To communicate. We want to allow them to communicate. This feels like a, a, a philosophical podcast today <laughs> i feel like the way i'm i feel like i'm talking weird i feel like everything i'm saying is very this is uh yeah. <laughs> this and uh if you look that you know it's yeah. if it feels kind of strange Maybe i don't know 8 a.m start it's that 8 a.m slow start i guess when when i'm tired i talk a little <laughs> you know what it is i feel like i'm talking slower than i usually do yeah right and because i'm talking slower it's making my point sound a little more important and it's making me discuss them as more of concepts and to make yeah. sure everybody understands them. <laughs> I feel weird today, Josh. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> You're not running out of breath, at least. No. You know what's funny is I noticed that. Like, this is the first time <laughs> I feel like like I'm talking for extended periods of time. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, like I, I got there's this. air in my lungs still. <laughs> All right. The last kind of socialization is, and this is the key one, this is the one that everybody misses environments Mm. right and environments means does your dog know how to interact with the world around them and when i say interact with the world around them our goal with environmental socialization is creating neutrality to the world around them right Mm. i want to make sure my dog is not scared by trash cans cars backfiring fireworks in the distance uh you know neighbors running down the driveway whatever any number of things that might spook a dog manhole covers on the ground this that right i want to make sure that they've been around these things enough where they start to become neutral to them Mm -hmm. right now i think the key here is any situation you go in You need to ask yourself, are we going into this situation to socialize with people, to socialize with dogs, or to socialize with environments? Let me give an example of, because here's the thing, right? You can only improve on one at a time, Mm -hmm. right? So let me give you an example of what I see people do wrong. Okay. We use the example of Platform Brewery, because since I go there every week, I see some (laughs) ridiculous shit happen there, (laughs) right? Yeah. So last Monday whatever nice day out you know it was popping up there trivia is rolling by the way our greatest win in the history of the last two years of us doing trivia was last monday okay (laughs) there were i think almost 20 teams and typically speaking there's only about eight right 20 teams there 
the way the trivia works is you got rounds, right? You got six rounds, right? You got a halftime question, then you got an end question, right? Three questions per round. We weren't doing too hot, right? We're, we're like, we're down to like last round, whatever, you know? Finish off last round, and uh, um, we were in like ninth no no we were in like 12th place or something like we were far down we were like we counted ourselves out at this point like we had we had had, we had a bad day right mm-hmm. bonus question comes around here's how the bonus question works you get asked some sort of question in this case it was uh it was the the topic was words right and it said all of these words are going to start with the first two letters mm-hmm. right um we're going to give you the Webster definition of the word. You need to tell us what the word is, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I honestly am totally blanking right now on what those specific words are, but I think they, they began with like Q-U or, or some sort of, it, they were weird words, mm-hmm. right? With that question, you could wager as many points as you want. You wager up to 15 points, right? Okay. 15 points would be a full send. If you win that, you get 15 points. If you get even one of those wrong, you lose 15 more points, which fucking tanks you, right? Yeah. So we full sent it on the 15, right? Hard question. We were confident in it. Got it right. We were the only team there to get it right. First place victory, which means that multiple other teams full sent and didn't get it, dropping them down low enough, oh, pushing us to the top. We won it. There were tears. We were jumping on tables. <laughs> we won our fucking twenty dollar gift card. Yeah. It was phenomenal. Oh, it's the best victory ever. <laughs> Anyways, in the midst of all of this, I'm digressing here, right? How I experienced improper socialization, right? Mm-hmm. Because you can't do all of them at the same time. If you do them all at the same time, you create a mishmash of the dog doesn't know what the fuck is happening, yeah. right? Yeah. There's a bunch of people there with dogs, whatever. They're all out of control and stuff. And I, I, I watched the situation. And dude, I was this close to taking my phone out, and taking a video of it. It was so ridiculous. Jesus, right? <laughs> okay. So they're in a new environment, right? They're not creating neutrality to the environment. They're letting the dogs go all over the place. Obviously, first off, right? They let three dogs pull into the center greeting area, all with tension on their leash, all interacting, while like three people are on the ground petting and kissing all of the dogs right Uh, so they're doing bad environmental socialization bad dog socialization and bad people socialization yeah recipe for disaster this is why your dogs are out of control whatever digressing so you gotta pick one at a time when you go to a new place right i think at one point somebody even picked up one of the dogs throughout the process and started holding it like a baby or something like that it was ridiculous whatever so you gotta pick one at a time right because the more we isolate a specific thing, the better the dog will improve on it with, yeah. right? So people socialization. If we're going to be socializing a dog with other people, that means that we are going to be getting them interacting with people. Obviously, you have to make sure you're doing it the right way, which we'll get into the specifics of how to do so. But if you're doing that, it should be done in an environment that they're comfortable in, mm-hmm. right? Because if we're putting them in a new environment, and having them interact with new people, they're going to be distracted by the environment. They're already going to be in a higher state of stress or arousal, and the socialization is not going to be as fluid or organic as we want it to be. Yeah. In addition to that, if we have other dogs around and we're trying to do people interaction or people socialization, they're going to be distracted by the dog and could potentially create problems because since there's going to be a lot of interaction going on, those people are still going to be to some extent a resource, which can create problems with the dog and dog socialization, mm-hmm. right? If we're socializing with dogs, we have to make sure that, again, it's in a neutral environment, that the dog is not uh, new to them or anything, right? We need to make sure that um, we're not having any interaction from the people standpoint, right? Mm -hmm. Because if they're trying to interact with other dogs, any information we're giving is going to be giving mixed messages. It's going to be reinforcing certain things in a way that we don't want to be. It's going to be creating resources, which creates competition, Mm -hmm. and it creates problems as well, right? So that's why we always say when you're having your dog interact with a new dog, it's about the dogs. You don't interact with the dogs while they're interacting with each other, period, right? You supervise it, and you only step in if there's a problem that you need to address. Mm -hmm. That's it, right? Environmental socialization, right? We don't want to interact with people or dogs because when we're in that environment, we want our dog neutral to all of those things around them, Mm. right? So understanding the three types of socialization is the first step here and understanding that you can't intermingle them, 
right? It doesn't work yep. that way. You have to allow the dog to socialize with one at a time, at a time, at a time, yep. right? You need to know when you go to a situation, which one is it going to be? And you need to pick it and you need to make sure you stick with it. Mm. If you want this to go efficiently. Again, I'm going for, I'm, I'm not saying that a dog fight is going to happen every time you do one of these wrong. Yeah. Obviously, I watched the worst situation possible <laughs> yeah. and a dog fight didn't happen. But yeah. that situation I know is not productive in any way, shape, or form to those dogs. Yeah. Right. If anything, it did create more problems by creating a stressful, hectic situation that will create more stress the next time they go to interact with another dog. Right. Mm-hmm. So now what I want to do, now I'm losing my breath. Now yeah. I'm talking too fast, <laughs> getting hyped up. <clears throat> All right. So now what I want to do is I want to read an article that is one of the first articles I ever read when I started training dogs, right? When I started learning about wow. this kind of stuff. So this is from Learberg.com, uh, gotcha. right? Uh, it's written by Ed Frowley, who Ed is uh, like the founder of Learberg, I'm pretty sure if I'm not mistaken. Old guy, very old school dog trainer, but he started kind of, <laughs> so so Learberg, here, here's where Learberg got popular. So Learberg, Learberg is a dog product um, uh, uh, sale website and e-commerce site, right? And they okay. also have their online university, right? Learberg got popular because in the sport dog world, they had this guy of the name Michael Ellis, who I talk about all the time. He's mm-hmm. one of the best sport dog trainers out there, one of the most instructional ones. His dog training DVDs are still to this day some of the best ones I've ever seen in my life. Um, and and Michael uh, has a lot of very, very good, interesting ideas on socializing uh, and training and all of that kind of stuff. Right. Whatever. Mm-hmm. So Ed started kind of regurgitating a lot of Michael's content. Right. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, Michael, they were kind of just commissioning for a lot of these courses and stuff like that. And since Ed was the founder, he wanted to kind of put his name in there with it. Whatever. It's fine. Gotcha. Okay. Right. So this socializing your new puppy is basically verbatim stuff I've heard Michael talk about like numerous times. Yeah. Right. So let's say this is written by Michael Ellis. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Because these are definitely Michael Ellis yeah. comments and commentary here. Okay. Now, one thing that I like, now this article is titled How to Socialize Your New Puppy, right? Yeah. One thing that I think everybody can take from the sport dog world, we talk about the differences a lot and in, in when it comes to actually training your dog and, and things that, that they do that are obviously not bad, right? But aren't as efficient with some of our clients just to how difficult some of them are to do, right? Mm. This is where I think that they have things going on, right? When they train these dogs, right, for sport work, particularly like Mondio Ring or IPO or any of these uh, protection uh, sports that they tend to do the majority of, right? <clears throat> Their number one goal is creating the most environmentally sound dog. Mm. They want a dog that can go anywhere around any type of distraction and essentially just tune it out like it's fucking nothing. Yeah. Right? That is something that all of my clients strive for, mm-hmm. right? They want a dog that they could take everywhere that's not going to be a nuisance. Yeah, right? 100%. 100%. So there are things that they do and that I learned early on in my training by following these methods, right, that create this, that if people were to do these things at home, they would immediately see massive results with their dogs, right? Okay. But the key is it starts with starting it right away with your puppy. <laughs> Yeah. Right? So let's get into this here. We get many emails on a weekly basis that deal with problems new puppy owners have as a result of poor socialization. Most of these people feel they have been doing the right thing with their puppies when, in fact, they've created the problems they face. The fact is socialization is one of the most misunderstood areas in dog training. The old school concept of socialization means you take your puppy out and get it used to interacting with people, places, and other dogs. When we explain that this thinking is exactly what causes many of the behavioral problems people face with new puppies or even adult dogs, they ask, how can I get my puppy socialized if I can't let him go out and play with other dogs? Or they will say they thought the way to deal with a shy puppy was to take it out and let strangers give it nice treats. So the puppy saw strangers as treat machines and not something to be afraid of. I have to admit, years ago, this is exactly how I recommended people socialize their puppies. The only problem was over time, I realized I was wrong, and there was much better ways to socialize dogs because he found Michael Ellis, and Michael Ellis explained better ways. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyway. I'm just saying. This is the key here, right? Our definition of socialization. <clears throat> 
our definition of socialization is to get our dogs comfortable with new places and circumstances. We want our dogs to be indifferent to people, places, and things. I want my dog to look at strangers as part of the environment and something to ignore, not something to interact with. When we take our dog into strange new environments, we want our dogs to willingly look to us for leadership and direction. Right. So this is the key here, right? What is socialization? Socialization is creating a dog that's neutral to these things, not creating a dog that gets all hyped up by them and excited and has this pot. Everybody wants them to have a positive association yeah. with these things. Yeah. Where in actuality, we don't want them to have a positive association. We don't want them to have a negative association. We want them to have a neutral, neutral. association with these things. Now, here's the thing. In the sport dog world, there are many people, and I'm sure them as well, that are of believers that... Uh, da, 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 that these dogs don't ever need to actually interact mm -hmm. with other dogs or mm -hmm. people, right? They kind of abide by the, we want the neutrality, and then we don't ever want them interacting with this kind of stuff, right? Which I understand, yeah. but that we have to be empathetic to what the clients want as well, and yeah. clients want dogs they can take out and socialize, right? Mm -hmm. But that's why I separate them with the people, dogs, and environments, and I am wholehearted agreeing of in environments. When I take my dogs out in public into new situations and new places, mm -hmm. I do not want them interacting with any of those things because I want them to be 100% neutral to them, yeah. right? And then I could save the socialization for people and dogs in controlled settings where I could isolate just that thing, mm -hmm. right? All right. That's so, a big word, controlled. Controlled, yeah. Not in a brand new environment yep. where you don't have any control of anything going on around you, which is what everybody does. Exactly. At Platform Brewery. <laughs> but speaking of, we're not dogging Platform. No, no, no. This not is not Platform's all. fault. Nope, not no, 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 them no. at all. This is just the people's fault. And it's this is just people. I see it there all the time. Yep. Right? All right. How we socialize our dogs. We start socialization the minute we get our dogs. It begins by showing the dog that we control every minute of its life. This is done through the use of leashes and dog crates. We also show the dog that we are fun to be around. This is accomplished through the use of food treats. As a general rule, small puppies have more drive for food than for toys. With most working breeds, this will change over time if the triggers have been met at a young age. But this is food for another article. We train with verbal markers. We work with puppies beginning with charging the mark and establishing a value for food rewards. This only takes a few days. Once we have it, we begin the work on the process of engagement. Right. So basically what he's saying is we socialize our dog by controlling everything going on around them. Right. Which is accurate. Right. If you control everything going around them and you use leashes and you use dog crates and you make sure you're fun to be around, you don't give the dog the opportunity to start rehearsing a lot of the problematic behaviors that we see them get with puppies. Mm -hmm. Right. Picking shit up, chewing your baseboards, getting into your trash can, jumping all over everything. Yeah. You know, like all of these things that we see people come in and say, oh, my God, my puppy does all of these things. It's because they don't control the world around the puppy, right? Mm -hmm. There's a reason why everybody says puppy-proof your house or, you know, you have a puppy, right? If you wouldn't do it with an infant, you shouldn't do it with a puppy, right? Yeah. And all of that comes down to supervision, right? Mm -hmm. Puppies, most people do not give puppies the proper supervision, no. right? And because not of that, the puppy develops these issues. And because of that, we have to then go in and fix these issues, mm -hmm. which actually are kind of because the owner allowed the dog to do it, yeah. right? People that are diligent about not giving freedom, using the crate all the time, using a leash to block the dog from having unsupervised time, typically don't run into a lot of these problems. Like, it really is as simple as that. Like, if you're on it, you might not ever experience it, but yeah. you got to do the hard work early on. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> then he obviously gets into uh, charging the mark. That basically means... You know, you do it with clicker training or, or, or marker training or whatever it may be. It, it means you're creating a positive association with a word, right? We use verbal markers, right? Good, yes, things like that. You know, basically what you do is you say yes, then reward. Yes, then reward. And it's just Pavlov's sequence, right, where you condition that word to have a positive association with it. Then we start engagement, right? Engagement. The core of our program on socializing your dog deals with engagement. When a dog is engaged with his handler, the dog is totally focused on the handler and ignores everything in the environment around him. This is a learned endeavor. A very few dogs will do this without training. If I had to put a number on it, I would say one in 10,000. That's a ridiculous number. <laughs> That's a ridiculous number. Yeah. The vast majority of dogs need to go through training steps to... <laughs> Like, how many dogs have yeah. you trained where you could make that yeah. accurate of an assessment? You've trained that many dogs. Jesus. <laughs> uh, the vast majority of dogs need to go through training steps to get and stay engaged with their handler. We start our puppies on engagement with high-value food treats. I don't mean the Walmart dog biscuits here. I mean small pieces of meat or some of the high-end all-natural dog treats we sell. 
there, look at him trying to, yeah, s- to push some stuff sneak there. it in there. Yeah, huh? yeah, yeah. <laughs> when the dog is like, you could use kibble for this. It's fine, guys. Yeah. <laughs> when the dog is looking at us, we mark the behavior and reward it with food treat. We also work engagement when the puppy is hungry. This means before we feed the dog, they quickly learn you're a cool owner that is fun to be around. The process of training engagement is beyond the scope of this article. I could write a book on it. The video I produced, titled The Power of Training Dogs with Food, that Michael Ellis did, (laughs) has a large (laughs) chapter on engagement. Engagement begins at home in a distraction-free environment. Your kitchen, garage, backyard. As the dog learns, uh, learns to become more and more engaged with the handler, trainers can begin to take the dog to new locations and working engagement in new places. In the beginning, we select distraction free environments. As the dog learns that new locations mean cool things happen between it and its owner, the level of distractions are increased. The goal of the trainer is to go to as many different locations as possible with their dog and work engagement drills. As the program progresses, the handler looks for locations that stress the dog. This will become evident because it will be more difficult to engage the dog. When that happens, back away from the distraction to the point where you can get and keep the dog engaged. Once this happens, you will continue to go back to that location and work on shortening the distance to the distraction. Okay, so engagement. What is engagement? Obviously, they kind of just discussed it, but the concept is can you keep your dog's attention on you around other things, right? Now, in the sport dog world, this is primarily done with food, right? Mm -hmm. We essentially use the dog's kibble, right? And let's say you have a puppy and you feed it twice a day, right? Take that morning meal, go into an environment, and just walk around. And you don't even need to get crazy with this, right? Like, obviously, there's a lot of sciencey stuff behind the way that they do it and the way we used to do it and stuff. But you can literally take that meal, go into a new environment, and just hand feed that meal in that new environment, right? Mm-hmm. Then for dinner, go into an environment, hand feed that meal in that environment, yeah. right? And over time, your dog will start to develop this concept that when you go somewhere new, they should pay attention to you for direction, right? Mm-hmm. Now, With puppies, we like to do this with food initially. With adult dogs, right? The key here is not that it's done with food. The key here is that you can maintain the dog's focus around these distractions. So we just use training for that, right? I'll go to a new environment with distractions, and I will just work on a basic training exercise. Can I keep my dog's focus enough in order to do sits, or downs, or leash walking, or whatever it may be. And essentially, you want to go to these environments and have the dog focused on you as opposed to off doing other things. Mm -hmm. Keep it short, keep it sweet, keep them focused on you, and start to neutralize those things around them, right? Mm -hmm. The more you can do that, the more focused the dog gets, the easier these things get, the more neutral they get to the stressors or the things that are scary to them, right? Mm -hmm. Next, the problem with strangers. The problem with allowing stranger to meet and greet your dog is there are very few people who understand this work. They can't read the body language of a puppy to understand when it is stressed or fearful. This can result in putting a puppy into fight or flight. Once that happens, you have a big problem to fix, and it's a whole lot easier to avoid a problem than to go back and try to fix that one. Um, So learn how to deal with strangers and your puppy. The correct way to act around someone's new puppy is to ignore the pup. (laughs) Don't invade its space. Don't look at it. Don't talk to it. Don't try and pet it. Your job is to find a way to tell everyone that approaches you when you are walking your dog exactly that. For every one person that understands this concept, there are 100,000 that don't. These numbers are ridiculous. (laughs) Where's it coming up with this grade scale? I am always amazed at how many people out there ignore your warning and walk right up to the dog and try to pet it. When that happens, it is time to get real serious with people. I'm far more concerned about my dog than I am about some idiot who can't think, listen, or follow directions about my dog. I agree. (laughs) Too many new dog owners are afraid to be rude to someone who invades their puppy's space. There are people who end up with a pup that becomes fearful of strangers. Fearful puppies often bark at people because their pack leader failed to protect them. Accurate which resulted in the stranger backing off. This only teaches the pup that acting aggressively works to drive scary people away. New owners then wonder why their pup goes off on everyone he sees. Well, it's because the owner trained the pup to do this. It is a lot easier to tell people who won't back off or who won't listen to back off. Don't worry about their feelings. They certainly are not someone you want as a friend if they ignore you. (laughs) He's right. He's not. Yeah, he's not wrong. He's right. (laughs) Listen, here's the thing, right? We're looking to create neutrality. 
most people don't understand understand how to interact with a dog properly. Mm-hmm. If the dog is excited, that person is going to reinforce all the negative behaviors of jumping, over arousal, biting, this, that, right? If the dog is scared, they're going to pressure the dog to a point where they put them in fight or flight, where the dog starts learning that barking at them, growling at them, biting at them makes them go away. So yeah. it's kind of a lose-lose both ways, which is why we don't want super positive or super negative. We want neutral, mm-hmm. right? And yes, that will create problems later on. And this is why I tell everybody, you tell everybody, please don't pet my dog we're training right now and then if they still ignore that you get more firm with them as you need to but if you don't do it because you're afraid of other people's feelings this is the key here right he just like he explained right here it will get worse because your dog will then realize they have to do it because you're not doing it yourself right Mm -hmm. what to do when strangers approach your pup the correct way to handle strangers is always be prepared with a bait bag full of high value food treats If you see that your pup is a little concerned about someone, then get the pup engaged with you. It's your job to become more interesting than the stranger, and if the food rewards are high enough, the pup will look at strangers as the trigger for their owners to play with them and give them treats. The same thing goes with new places that stress your puppy. If you see the pup is getting a little nervous, get him or get him engaged with you. Teach the pup that new scary places are not bad after all because they're places that they get to play with their owner and get cool dog treats. Now again, getting into this and he's talking about you know when a stranger approaches your pup i don't think he's talking about actually interacting with them i think he's talking when they approach you in Mm -hmm. general right because there are going to be people that come into your space that your puppy may be either stressed about or excited about and the key is still create that engagement around that trigger right now again he's pushing the food very heavily right now which i don't disagree with you know if you have a very food driven dog i would recommend doing that but keep in mind to all of our clients that are doing just training with say e-collars or this or that the key is not the food. The key is giving the direction in these situations, right? Mm-hmm. Getting the dog focused on another task, right? Yeah. Uh, and making sure you have something motivating enough where you can get the dog to stay focused on that task, whether it's a high value reward or a high value correction. <clears throat> All right. Why not let strangers feed our puppy? So why not let strangers give your puppy treats? A good question with a couple of answers. Allowing other people to give your puppy treats only turns other people into distractions for your dog. You're essentially training your dog to ignore you around other people, places, and things. Where's the sense in that? It's true. We don't want to create more arousal with things. Yeah. (sighs) Two, this is an important one. If you have a dog that is fearful of strangers, you run the risk of the dog's food drive overpowering the weak nerves. When that happens, the dog will go to the stranger, take the food, And once the food is gone, the dog is still left with his concern about the stranger. Quite often, those dogs will then bite because aggression has been a learned reaction. It makes strange people get away from them. So you essentially trick the dog into going by something that's scary because Mm -hmm. they're more motivated by the food. Then once they're not distracted by the food anymore, they realize, holy shit, this person is right next to me. And then they get scared and they bite. Mm -hmm. Right? It ha- this happens, yeah. right? And this is what people don't understand. Again, I understand the logic of I want to create a positive association with this thing. But once you break down what's actually happening, you realize how much of a problem this can be. Three, mm-hmm. when people have a fearful dog and they allow strangers to give their puppy or dog food treats, the dog learns to expect it. There will come a time when you don't have a food reward to give to a stranger that is going to make the dog nervous. Don't kid yourself that the dog doesn't realize this. In its head, it's thinking, I was right. This person makes me nervous and is not one of those people that gives me treats. So I'm going to nail him. When the dog owner is in the position where they have a fearful, aggressive dog and they wonder why, the fact is that they have, the fact, the fact, there's there's spelling errors here. The the fact it what they have done will <laughs> amplify the fear aggression in the dog. That's why I was like reading it like over yeah. and over. I was like, wait, I, am I am I seeing something wrong here? Wait, and this is on their website. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <sighs> Spell check. So again, they learn to expect this, right? Then suddenly it's not there, and mm-hmm. they're not learning to actually cope with the person, right? They're just getting distracted with it. That's yeah. all that's happening. Just a band aid. That's it. All right. What about strange dogs? Let's start with the fact that it often only takes one instance where a dog is attacked by another dog for that dog to become dog aggressive for life. New dog owners do not have the experience to recognize the signals and signs of dominance and aggression in a strange dog. For these two reasons, new puppy or new dog owners should never allow strange dogs around your dog. Not ever. Totally correct. The amount of times we have clients come in and they're like, 
my dog got attacked at the dog park one day or we got chased by an off-leash dog out on our walk and from that point on he was dog aggressive or dog reactive or whatever it may be it does yeah. happen that fast yeah i mean it's such an an, an impression I don't know. It's it's such a like flash thing that's so mm-hmm. traumatic to them, you know. Like, I mean, if it happened to a person, it'd be the same thing. If mm-hmm. you if you went on a certain street or a certain bar or whatever, and you got beat up, and sure. not, you know, sure. you're gonna remember that forever, and you're never gonna go to that bar again. Yeah, hundred <clears throat> percent. And this is why we always say as well: we only socialize dogs with dogs that we know and trust. Mm-hmm. That's it. If you do not know and trust the dog, you're setting yourself up for failure with this. Those who chose to ignore this advice need to read the article I wrote titled, How to Break Up a Dog Fight Without Getting Hurt. (laughs) Plug. Have a look at the dog bite photos that have been sent to me from people who read the article after trying to break up a dog fight and then going to Google to find out what they did wrong. There's nothing wrong with your dog having other dog friends, but the way to start your puppy learning manners around a friendly dog is to first find someone who thinks like you about dogs. Then look for a dog that is aloof to other dogs. I want a dog that ignores my puppy. In the beginning, the best of all worlds is to find a dog that doesn't want to play and is totally aloof to my puppy. If I keep my pup on a long line, I could work some engagement around the other dog. The perfect adult dog is one that will put a puppy in its place for inappropriate behavior without actually hurting it. This has to be done before the pup is 8 to 10 months old. It goes without saying that this work is always done when the owner's there to supervise. Putting two strange adult dogs together is never recommended unless you follow the correct protocol, and this article is not the place to talk about that. Uh, I wrote an article on why dog parks are bad. He's really pushing all these articles. Yeah, he is. If you're a new puppy owner, you may want to visit that article. With that said, you could use the dog park to help train your dog. The way to do it is to stay outside the fence with your dog and work engagement exercises without risk to your puppy. Um all true right Mm -hmm. the the key of this is the reason why we don't socialize out and about is because one it gets in the way of our environmental socialization and two we don't know and trust those dogs it's not natural right again next time when we do part two and we get more into how to socialize other dogs we'll get more into the nitty-gritty of it but that's the beginning of it Mm -hmm. what if a strange dog approaches us on a walk your job as a new dog owner is to learn how to become a pack leader most people are not born pack leaders but anyone can learn to be one I've written an article on this and done training DVDs on it. (laughs) Part of the responsibility of a pack leader is to protect the lower-ranking pack members. This means it's your job to protect your dog if it's approached by another strange dog. Mm -hmm. If you walk in an area where there are strange dogs, carry a stout walking stick or bear spray. When a strange dog approaches you, step between your puppy and that dog. Sound very convincing and threaten the other dog to turn and leave. If it comes close, don't hesitate to use the stick or spray. I will guarantee you, if you crack a strange dog over the head with a stout stick, it will remember exactly who you are and will never come after you or your dog again. Uh. (laughs) Not only that, but (laughs) but in doing this, you just gained a great deal of respect from your puppy or dog. Here again, I need to bring up a point that far too many people are concerned about hurting other dogs' owners' feelings. If you need to do this because the owner refuses to control their dog, So be it. There are enough idiots in the world, and I don't really care what they think about the crazy guy (laughs) with the big stick. Listen, I tell everybody, when a off-leash dog rushes you, the absolute number one responsibility you have is protecting your dog, right? Whatever that means. I've had dogs before where I could just turn and threaten them with a motion or a sound or a no or something like that, and that stops them. And then I've had other dogs that don't care about that that I've had to kick in the head real hard. Yep. Right? Sorry. My goal is not to hurt dogs, right? But my first goal is to protect the dog that I have, especially when it's with my client's dogs. Yeah. Right? So listen, you know, what are you, you going to do about it? There's leash laws for a reason, right? You go out mm-hmm. and about, and, and, and if there's a place where it says all dogs need to be on a leash, and suddenly there's an off-leash dog running at you, that's a big problem, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. And that's your job is to protect them. And he is 100% correct, right? If you don't protect them in that situation, they will learn they need to do it themselves. And that's the key mm-hmm. with all of this when it comes to socialization, and particularly if you have fearful yep. dogs or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. You have to be the one handling this stuff for them. Yeah. I just, <laughs> I just imagine Carry the big stick. Yeah, I know. I just imagine you in that, like when you were at Edgewater that one time, oh, that yeah, big Jesus. dog, and then you just bear mace the dog or something. I didn't bear. <laughs> no, if oh, <laughs> like, I was say. like oh, a Jesus. big stick or a bear, like, and that dude would have lost his shit. <laughs> you bear mace a dog. 
<laughs> oh man. But I, but I, here's here's the other side of this, right? In a lot of these situations with off leash dogs, it's usually a social dog that the owner is just a fucking idiot and just keeps yeah. them off of the leash. Yep. Right? Because their dog is yeah. so social. Right. But here's the key. There are a lot of situations where it's a dog. There's a lot of situations where it's a dog that is not social, that slips out of their collar, mm-hmm. slips out of their harness, gets past the front door, gets through the gate, whatever it may be, yeah. and actually wants to attack you or your dog. Mm-hmm. How am I supposed to know the difference? Yeah. I don't. can't. You will not. Which is why you have to address it the same no matter what. Yep. You have to. Yeah. Because once that contact is made and the fight starts, yeah. You kind of shit out of luck at that point. Yeah, definitely. So, all right. Last part. Socialization begins at home. The fact is a well-socialized dog starts right in your home. Teaching your new dog manners and how you expect it to live in your home sets the stage for the relationship. We now raise our puppies in an X-Pen and a dog crate in the house. I'm in the process of raising a Malinois puppy at the moment. He currently is six months old and has lived in the X-Pen since he was eight weeks old. I'm lucky because I can have my X-Pen right next to my desk and my office has ceramic tile in case any house training mistakes. Because of this arrangement, there have been very few. When the puppy is not in the pen, he's in his dog crate, but he spends most of his time in the pen. This is where I taught him not to jump up at the sides on the pen when people come in. If he jumps up, we simply say, nope, and step back. They quickly learn there is no interaction when they are jumping up. The beauty of this system is that we can take the pen into our living room where we have our adult dogs, and the puppy can be a part of the family without the constraints of the dog crate. It can lay in the X-Pen where the older dog dogs lay around as we watch TV. This is just a great way to teach the puppy not to be wild in the home. In addition yeah. to this, we never allow our puppies to be off leash in the house. When they're in the X Pen, they are on the lead. We use uh, do do yeah, I don't know what this is. We use a leash that tethers uh, the dogs to us at all times, allowing puppies to have free range in your home is a license for disaster. Puppies that are tethered to you can't get into the garbage. They can't sneak around the corner and pee and poop. They can't jump on visitors or kids. Now pet owners think the leash is only for outside and nothing can be further from the truth. Using a tether in the house is a great way to control your pup and head off problems. Uh, accurate, you know, obviously stopping problems in the house with puppies. You know, you want to manage things and make sure they can't rehearse them first, but that's obviously not the goal of this post. So we're not going to talk about that. Yeah, and he was a little extreme, but as long as you're keeping yeah. good supervision. Supervision, have the leash on the dog. You know, I don't know if it needs to be in a pen all the time, obviously, but yeah. it should be in a crate very frequently, you know. And you should be uh, managing it as much as possible. Yeah. I will make fun of you if you tether your puppy to you at all times, though. A little waist harness. Yeah, a little waist harness. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's a good stuff there. All right. That's part one. I like it. We're going to end it. Um, all right. So that's part one of socialization. <clears throat> A lot of interesting little rants here. A couple questions. Mm-hmm. We'll get more into the socialization in detail, but start thinking about these concepts first, right? So we broke down the initial concepts of socialization, and I want yep. everybody to digest that a little bit right now, right? Mm-hmm. From there, we could talk about the actual specifics behind it. So good stuff. Yes. Doobie, follow-up points. Anything? No. I love that article. I think most of the points are, are good. I mean... Obviously, it's the same thing that you correlate to with your your clients. Hey, I think he's a little more extreme in some things, but all of this stuff again, somebody's going to push in more direction than the other. Obviously, yeah, it's exactly. Fine. Yeah, but <clears throat> I think socialization is a thing that we need to talk about more in depth. So mm-hmm. I'm excited for this. So it's good stuff. Yeah, you got to stop explaining everything so well because it's like I. I have questions and then you answer it like <laughs> two sentences later and I'm like oh, and I'm then I'm like I know he's gonna ask me that and then I'm like you already answered all my shit. <laughs> so is what it is, you know. Yeah, but uh, yeah, that cool. was a good one. Uh, Josh Dobay Productions. Josh Dobay Productions. dot com. Hit him there, uh, and. Yeah, hit us up at Miracle Canine Training. If you guys have questions, keep shooting DMs. Get a couple more questions to answer here. Next week, we got Memorial Day. We're going to be out of town for a little bit, so we're going to figure out exactly when we're recording that podcast, but we'll still have something for you next week. Woo! We'll still have something. Until then, thanks for